a short guide to value zones. Now, we're going to start by defining what I mean by that, and then we'll get into some examples. Uh, so the first painting we're going to look at is a, a very straightforward Maxfield Parish painting that is awesome, just an unbelievably beautiful painting. But I start with it because it shows us in a very straightforward way a really solid painting that's structured on three values. And that's the idea. When we talk about a good painting, I'm going to lay out the idea here that a good painting is going to be utilizing three values in a strategic way. What three values are we talking about? That differs. How those three values are used? That differs too. Maxfield Parrish uses them here in, in a way that, that makes a lot of sense. He has his darker darks up front. He has a middle value in the, in the middle distance, and then he has his lightest value as the sky. So that's pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, but I just wanted to show you, we're going to come back to that painting and look at some details in it in a little bit. But I'm going to move to the next picture by... Fantin Latour, and it's another picture where the, the, the painting can be broken down into a, a slightly more complicated three value structure where the darkest dark is the vase, and then there are various values that transition off of that that are also dark, and then we have the middle value, which we could say is the background. And then we have various objects and colors that transition off of that. And then we have our lights, which is the, the whiter flowers and the light fruit on the right. Now, when I say three values, what I mean is that when we're talking about representational painting, they're obviously all not going to be one value. So each value I'm going to refer to as a zone. And a value zone is a, a tiny or a compressed range of values. So, like in this one, if we're talking about the middle values, we're going all the way from the background value to the darker grapes and all the way through some of the slightly darker purple flowers. And then we could, we could get specific about each one of those. But that's the big idea. You're, you're using three values, and you're or organizing them in a particular way. And now the rest of the examples are going to be different strategies that lay out exactly how you might run variations on that particular idea. Uh, it is possible to make a good painting with two values or even one. But when you start to get into more values than three, that's where things start to get a little bit iffy. And uh, so let's, let's move to the next picture. We have another Fantin Latour painting. And he's doing the same thing as in the other painting, except that it's a little bit simpler, and he's, he's, a, he's exemplifying a particular idea. So I want to describe that for you here. So we have... The lights are the lighter parts of the flowers. The darks are just the, the red and the green leaves. And then the rest of the picture are the middle. Now the lights and the middles differentiate from each other very, very clearly. But the darks don't really transition off of anything. They're a little bit darker like the middles are a little closer to light than they are towards dark. And in this one, the, the trick that he's using is that he makes a big deal about how the dark value zone contains the brightest red and then these greens. And because the red and the greens are all the same value and they're touching, we get this really beautiful, rich move off of that and the rest of the picture is just kind of set up to help that relationship work. Now this one we're going to go back to the first 
Phantom Latour picture and look at it a little bit more closely. Now that we've defined what the big values are, I want to point out a couple different things. So in this close-up of the fruit, what one of the strategies that Latour in, engages in, in the last painting and in this one, is that he'll have multiple objects that are totally different from each other at the same value touching. So I want to point out that the table in this close-up is the same value as the red apple. And you can see where they touch. You see that real soft looking edge where they touch, but then the edges are very hard when the apple is up against the fruit or the table's up against the fruit. Um, and then the same thing happens as, as the table moves to the left. Notice how the table gets darker and it makes less of a transition with the grapes. So that's what he's doing. He's trying to keep the grapes tied to the value compression or the value zone that he's doing on the table. And then uh, we move to the next close-up slide and we have the background is the same value as the green grapes. For the most part, you can see that the green grapes are, are a little bit lighter but they're basically the same value and, and they're designed to be. And actually, the ones on the edge, the top of the grapes, those are a little bit darker. The grapes only get lighter as they move down. And then as, uh, the, as we move down, the, the red grapes are mostly the same value, but a little bit darker than the green. But the idea there is the green and the red, again, are mixing at the same value. And we get a lot of color complexity and richness from that. The last close-up for this painting is the flowers. And what I want to point out there is that we have the full range of Latour's values just in this one shot, where we have those deep darks, we have those light lights, and we have all of these middles that are kind of transitioning every which way. But that, that one flower, that purple flower in the middle, it's a little lighter in the middle, but look how those purples transition up against the edge. He's doing that specifically to tie that, those purples that are much, much brighter at the same value as the background. It just creates a ton of color complexity. Really beautiful stuff. And if you look at the totality of this Latour picture and you just see how rich the space is and just how beautiful the color is, all the things I just pointed out are why. So the next painting is by a British painter named Raymond Seaton. And he does a lot of work where he's kind of mimicking Fantin Latour. So I thought I would throw this in. This is a different artist's sort of solution to the same problem. And it's pretty cool. He, he does a, a great job. He he, he's a contemporary artist. He, um, I wasn't able to find out whether or not he's still alive. I, I found some things on the internet that made me think he died recently. Um, but if you cut this picture basically in half, you have the, the lights that are at the bottom and then the lights that are sprinkled through the top. And then we have the top. There's a couple darks that are sprinkled in, but pretty much the whole top half of the picture is all middle and middle dark. Like all the values in the painting go between the orange in the blue and the, sorry, the orange in the background and the blue in the background. The orange is a little bit lighter and the blue's a little darker. All the values that are sprinkled through the top of the picture are all between those. It's a wonderful idea. And nothing that's in the light is infiltrated by any of those darker uh, middle values. So we have this really stark contrast between light and middle, and, and then there's a transition between middle and dark. So we could say in this one that the values that he's using, he has using a light light, he's using a middle dark, in a dark middle, 
Does that make sense? Like the dark and the middle transition off of each other. Um, and at that dark, slightly darker middle value, that's where a lot of those colors he's using are brightest. So he's just, he's just calibrated this picture perfectly to make it as rich as possible um, and for a really great result. And if he's trying to mimic what Fantin Latour is doing, he's doing an awesome job because he has basically a slightly different strategy, but he gets a lot of the same results. So now we move back to Caravaggio, who was on our, our cover, the, the, the title page, the title slide of our video. And I wanted, I like to use Caravaggio because he's a wonderful example of a very specific use of this value sort of strategy where Caravaggio likes to use, he has very, very light lights. He has very, very dark darks and the dark darks usually dominate the picture. And the question with Caravaggio is what is he doing with his middle? And actually that's a good question to ask for most artists because they're usually you're going to have light lights, you're going to have dark darks, but where is your middle and then how are those three things being used? Here, dark dominates, the lights are the smallest one, and the middle values are all just a little bit lighter than his darks. And it creates this really intense sort of cinematic effect. Uh, and the fact that he cuts out the ground plane and places us in the scene like, like we're right up against, like we're, there's a crowd and we're in it. And we're seeing this scene play out from our point of view in the crowd. It's just an awesome move. But the, the, the way that he structures his values is, is the, are the primary reasons why we read the picture the way we do and why he's able to highlight very specific details, um, like the armor and the helmet of the guy in the foreground, Jesus and Judas, uh, and how they're both surrounded by those deep darks. Um, he kind of makes a map of where he wants those lights, and then he just turns the lights off everywhere else. It's a very cool way to organize a picture. Another Caravaggio is the crucifixion of St. Peter, and He's largely doing the same thing here. It's just that he has a lot more light. And, I mean, the more I look at this one, we could probably argue that this one has four values rather than three because we have, we have lights, which are the, the light, like the, the loincloth and the, the shirt of the guy on the bottom. And then we have the skin, which we could argue the skin tones in all of these are a little bit darker than the lights. And then the guy with the shirt in the background and on the left, the orange pants, there are some places where there's sort of a middle light, but then there are some values in the dark where there are middle darks as well. So in this one, I, I am gonna go with four values, but if you squint, you only really see three. So we can nitpick all we want, but ultimately when we squint, and we see only three values, that means it's structured that way. And, and like the, what I want to bring your attention to is this really cool move that Caravaggio uses. If you squint at the full picture and you look at the green pants in the background, what happens is that, that the green pants disappear into the background when you squint. And so when we move to the close-up, what you start to realize is that look at the right hand side of the background. See how Caravaggio gives us a slightly lighter gray on the right hand side of the background up against those green pants. On the left, we have the shadow, the rope, and then we have a darker background. But it's the intensity of the green pants is designed to transition the viewer off of that that background figure and into the background so that they can then transition around the picture and come back in. It's just a brilliant move. And, and it's, 
it's done by controlling the value in a very, very particular way and also brightening up the picture. This picture doesn't have a lot of bright colors, right? We have uh, um, some bright cloth on the left. We have those orange pants, the blue on the right, that fabric. Um, there's something going on there, but it's kind of dull. But this green is just so rich and, um, and green. It's... Uh, very interesting to look at and, and, and consider with the rest of the picture. Uh, so we're back to Maxfield Parish. I wanted to look at this picture again. And we talked about the big idea behind the painting where the way he's structuring his values is his highest contrast is in the foreground, his darks are in the foreground, his uh, middle values are all in the snow, and then in the background he goes lighter. But I want to draw your attention to how he just goes an extra level deeper in terms of making use of all this. So I want to draw your attention to the house. If you start on the right-hand side, notice the basic values of the house are the same value as the snow. And it's no accident that the snow is purple and the house is yellow. In a scenario like we're seeing in, realist, in realistic terms, the snow would not be purple, it would be much colder because the sky is colder. You might get a little bit warmer snow, but Parrish is just coming in and saying, nope, I've got a yellow house. It's as, it's a cold, as cold a yellow as I can let it get and still be at night. So it's actually kind of warm. And then he has the yellow up against the purple. But as the yellow in the house moves to the left, the house slowly catches up to the value of the tree. There is a wonderful connection between the yellow and the purple, just in terms of hue, but also their values as they move to the left. And also the yellow gets more orange as the tree, as it moves towards the tree and the tree is more blue. And those are compliments that are picking up on each other. It's just genius level organizational painting um, that starts with those big ideas about value that set you up. And then you can go into the details and start making these, these smaller modifications that just make the picture just go up a level. Um, this next picture by Maxfield Parrish is another example of a, of a very solid three value painting. But it's, the structure is not as clean cut as in the last one. And the way I like to look at this picture is that the values are spread out a lot more because there's a lot more space and a lot more information. But if you just look at that rock at the very bottom that's reflecting in the pool. So the rock is your deepest dark. The reflection is the middle value. And... The, the, the lightest light there, the reflection of the sky, that's our light. Now move through the picture and you can tie every other value in the whole picture to those. As long as you give yourself a little bit of room on the light. Because the cool light at the bottom compared to the sun that's hitting the tree trunk on the right, it's a little bit slightly darker on the tree trunk. Um, but it's also warmer and he's just, you know, there's a little bit of range in that particular value, um, but an absolutely beautiful picture. And uh, I wish I had a better photo of it. That's a, a photograph of a printed calendar that this painting was on. Um, Max the Parish was an illustrator, a lot of his stuff. Um, it's easier to get photographs of the printed things than it is to get photos of his originals because they're all in private collections. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move on to some stuff that's a little bit less than traditional. Um, but after we looked at Caravaggio and his mode of using three values, I wanted to look at this Lucian Freud painting, which is my favorite Lucian Freud painting. Um, and I've been able to visit this one many times in person um, because it was in St. Louis when I lived there. And uh, it's just an awesome painting to look at in person. But the, he, he kind of uses the same idea, but he just switches the values around. So he has a deep dark, he has a light light, but his middle is more on the side of his light values and his darks are isolated all by themselves. 
Whereas in Caravaggio, the lights are isolated all by themselves. So you end up with a profoundly different uh, effect just by sort of running the same play, but reversing um, some of the, the basic moves. Next up, we have Walton Ford, and uh, he has some, he has like a formula that he kind of uses for all his work, and it, it's, it works beautifully, so I wanted to point it out, and, and we could just bring up almost any of his work, and, um, and he's running pretty much the same play, but uh, his, his paintings are watercolor, and, and normally I focus on oil paintings in, in these, these lectures and these discussions, but uh, Walton Ford is a watercolor person, and his, his organizational ideas are so good that I wanted to highlight them. So this tiger picture, um, he kind of mixes his darks and his middles in the foreground and on the animal, and then he lets his light take over in the background. And I think that this has to do with the fact that it's watercolor. Like he has to build the picture from leaving the white and then developing things down darker. So he always has a lighter background. And then like notice in the, the zone of the picture that's on the tiger, the lightest light on the tiger is considerably darker than the sky. And that is by design because if, the fur on the tiger was the same value as the background, there would be a giant hole punched in the tiger, and we can't have that. So notice how he has the same value of the red of the tiger as the grass, and then there's a, you can keep going. There's a whole bunch of other little things that are going on, but when you squint, you kind of run into basically two values. There's the sky, and then there's the landscape with the animal, and then there might be some little transitions towards dark, but it's, it's when you squint, it kind of works as a two-value picture. The next Walton Ford, I don't know what kind of bird this is, um, but it's the same idea as the last one, except that the lights in the bird in this one, he lets them get a little bit light, but he also lets his darks get much darker, so we have the, the, the light is in the background, the middle is in the white feathers of the bird, and probably the landscape, like the mountain in the background, if they don't touch, but if they did touch, they would be very similar to the feathers, the white feathers, and then everything else transitions off of the darks. So it's the same move with a slightly wider range, which is always good to play around. You don't want, if you're going to be running the same play over again, you have to make sure that you're running variations on it so the viewer doesn't pick up on that. And then you get accused of uh, repeating yourself all the time. Uh, this next one is by Howard Pyle. He was an American illustrator, late 19th century. I think that he worked in the early 20th century, but he was one of the people who started the American sort of illustration industry with these really awesome full color oil paintings. And he's running three values. And the cool thing about this picture is that none of his lights are really, really light. But you can see where his lights are in the ship and in the background. And then his middles are in the foreground. And his darks are in the middle space of the picture. And I keep going back to the sail on the little boat in the foreground. Up at the top of the sail, where it's blue, it's a little bit darker than the yellow that's behind it. But as that sail goes down, it becomes the same value as the yellow above it. They only like touch, or they have to sort of jump over that middle mast. They don't touch, but we get, when you squint, you get the connection between those two. And that, that blue that's the same value up against that orange or yellow, they just set each other off. And... If that's not enough, notice that at the top of the picture, the sky gets light and then it gets darker. And it gets darker right at the top of those sails and the smoke where it's all orange. It's not a coincidence that 
the purple or blue sky is the same exact value as the, the sunlit um, sails. Uh, this is the, the kind of stuff that a, a colorist like, um, like Pyle would have been doing all the time. So next, we're, we're going to get into some, some more unconventional um, solutions to this, uh, this same problem here. We're going to go into Claude Monet here, and, and this is an, another... I, I really like these paintings, so they show up in my videos a lot. But I wanted to show you this particular version of the cathedral um, that he painted so often that I'll pronounce it... Uh, I won't pronounce it right because it's a French... French pronunciations are hard. Um, but the values that he's using in this one, his lights are pretty light. He doesn't have any really dark darks. And he has a middle that's pretty much smack in the middle. The middle value kind of dominates. We could argue that maybe it's broken into thirds, but maybe it's like one quarter is light, one quarter is dark, and then two quarters, half, are the middle value. There are no darkest darks at the top, and there are no lightest lights at the bottom. What he does is he uses the top half of the tower to transition his middle and his light down. He uses the bottom half of the building to transition his middle and his dark up. And where they come together is where he has to be really, really careful. And then and I have these close-ups where you can see inside each one of those values, you can see all the changes in hue. And I know that's something I haven't brought up a lot because I've been focusing on the bigger ideas, but the way that you really take advantage of this value zone thing is because you only have three values, you can organize them however you want, but there's still only three. It's simple. But when you have an opportunity where you have a value shape, it's, it's incumbent upon you to change hue as many times as you can get away with. So when we go to the bottom and we start looking at the doorway, we can look at those oranges or those blues, those reds, those purples. There's so many different colors inside that really simple uh, value zone that that's where the complexity in the picture comes from. And, and, and the, all of these cathedral pictures by, by Monet are just awesome examples. Now the next painting is by Chaim Soutine, and this is probably one of his most famous paintings, the, the ray fish, and I think one of his better paintings. Um, and, and he's a, a really unusual artist. I think he's one of the most unique painters of the 20th century in that some of his paintings, it's easily argued that they're some of the best paintings of the 20th century, but like some of his paintings are even easier to argue are some of the worst paintings of the 20th century. So he's all over the place with his work and um, you don't want to make the mistake of, of assuming that it's good because he made it because a lot of the time it's not. But this painting I wanted to highlight because he does some really clever things where it comes to color and he lets other things go. I mean he's obviously not trying to draw realistically and He's not trying to do value in a way that's realistic to light the scene properly. Um, he has his own concerns. And, but the, the interesting thing is, is a wild man like this is, is, is employing the same solutions that someone like Caravaggio would have been using or someone a lot more traditional. And I think that's, that's really interesting because it shows you that when it comes to value there are a few things that work really well, and if you engage them, you can just run with the best solutions over and over and over and over again, and no one will ever catch on, unless they're, you know, one of us, um, and they're, they're informed. But, so what I want to point out about this painting on a big scale and then a slightly smaller scale is that we have the ray fish, and... Well, first of all, in a, in a big sense, it's three values, right? We have our dark that runs down the middle, and we've sort of broken up on the bottom and on the top. And then we have a middle value, which kind of dominates the tomatoes and the guts 
uh, and parts of the ray fish and parts of the background, and then we have our lights. With the ray fish itself, on the right hand side, notice how the fish gets lighter and it creates a little bit more contrast on the right with the background. But the cool thing is, is that it moves to the left. The reds in the fish are the same value as the greens in the background. He's trying to create contrast on the right and he's trying to take contrast away on the left. So things get punchier and more graphic on the right and they get softer and more complex and slower on the left. And we move to the next detail shot. You can see on the left where the background green sort of swings around and it, it makes a move up to the middle and it you can see the background, it's up against that shadow. Now, if Soutine is lighting this picture properly or the way it's lit everywhere else in the picture, there would be a shadow on the left over the background uh, from the fish. So that little dark to the left of the tomatoes and to the left of the guts, that, that would just be dark all the way over. He, he brings that background green, he swings it all the way in so that it's, it's not entirely in close proximity with the guts, but it's close. And notice how that, that little back part of the table is the same value as the green on the left. That's designed to sort of tie the red in what's with, with what's going on on the right. Now, this is where it really gets interesting. As you move to the right, like take the tomatoes, notice that the tomatoes and the guts are mostly the same value, but they're all different reds. And just look at how tight the values are and how many changes in hue there are. It's, it's just, it's getting, it's getting insane when you get in there and look at it at that level. But the cool part is it's a totally unrealistic move. Again, the background green would be in the dark here, but look what he does at the top of the tomatoes, just to the left in between the guts and the tomato. There's a patch of green background that should not be there, but he brings it in because he wants that green next to the tomato. Otherwise, the, the tomatoes, if you take that out, it flattens the whole thing and just takes away all the fun out of that, that middle, just disgustingly gory passage. Um, a very, very cool series of decisions uh, that make that part up. Um, I could go on and on about it, but I don't want this video to be too long. So we're going to go back to something a little bit more traditional. But I left it at the end because this painting, we would normally think of it as being traditional, but the painting was made in like 1430 something. I mean, it's so old that one point perspective was new when this picture was made. And that's a whole nother topic. But if you look at the, the one point perspective in this picture, it doesn't even really play out. It's, it's not even correct. And there's like three or four different vanishing points and it, it's all over the place. It's a very weird picture. But he, this is by Jan van Eyck. He's one of the first people to make the move to oil painting from egg tempera. At least he gets credit for that. There's a whole historical thing about that. But, um, but this painting, he does things with value that I think are really interesting and worth pointing out. So on a big scale, he's running three values, right? We got the guy on the right who's our light. His face, we could argue, is a transition, but if you squint, pretty much all their faces are in the light zone. And then you've got the middle zone, which includes the blue fabric the, and the red fabric, and then some transitions off of it, and then everything else is either a, a dark, a middle dark. Um, they're all transitioning off of those, um, those middles and those darks. But when we get a little bit closer... I want to point out something about the red fabric and the blue fabric. So the red fabric that Mary's wearing, it kind of it's designed to sort of drape down as we go. And you can kind of see how the value of the red relates to the value of the carpet. The carpet gets a little bit darker in the reds, but he throws in a slightly lighter orange to sort of optically mix and sort of even out so that it's basically the same as the, uh, the red fabric. 
But what I want to draw your attention to, in addition to that, is the green that runs through the red fabric. It is not a coincidence that there's green trim on the inside of this red fabric that comes down and it sort of snakes right through the middle. It's the same value green as the red. It snakes down and then it picks up a green in the carpet and keeps going down, wraps around, and comes back up on the right. And then there are some verticals for it to work with on the right hand side. But then we can also say the same thing about the blue fabric. As it comes down, that, that green trim that runs through, look at all the places where the green trim is again the same value as the blue. It starts out darker where the blue's darker, and as it gets down further down and to the left, the green gets lighter as the fabric, uh, the blue fabric gets lighter. Um, and he does that in order to make sure that the 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 values at the bottom of the picture stay tight, but he's he's keeping his color complexity um, really, really high. And this picture is just so rich and so beautiful. And, and it's so early in the, in the oil painting tradition. It's amazing how refined it is and how most painters uh, have really no idea how to produce effects like this. Um, but now you have a little glimpse into it. Um, and, and there's another detail of the same picture that I wanted to point out. If we go and zoom in on the patron who uh, is on the right hand, I believe he's the patron, but we're going to zoom in on his hands, and we're looking at his hands and the things he's holding. He's got, he's wearing the white outfit, and his hands and the two pieces of cloth and the box and the glasses, they're all isolated by his white shirt. And so there's not a lot of transition between the shirt and the hands and the fabric. They're, they're kind of surrounded and there's some little darks on either side. But what I want to point out is that inside that fabric, the, val the, the dark values on the hands are the same value as that gray fabric on the right. The light values in the hands are the same values as the yellow fabric and the dark value in the hands are the same as the gray fabric. Those are not coincidences. And all of them, everything in this little passage is darker than the white fabric. And everything around the white fabric in the picture is then darker than these, except for his face, which is designed to be a focal point and it's pretty dark behind his head. Um, but a lot of really interesting sophistication on a big scale in this picture and a lot of sophistication when you go through the nuances of all those details. And the last picture I wanted to show you was just in case you were starting to think that this only applies to the Western tradition, it does not. The value zone idea, the, the concept of, of organizing your picture in three values, and then changing your hues as many times as you can inside that, everybody uses it. This is a, a, a Japanese painting. I don't have the date in front of me, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the date, but it's, it's a pretty classic um, Eastern looking painting. And in this case, again, we have three values. We have the sun or that mountain in the back that's yellow same value as the sky and then we have the dark and we have that other middle value that transition they're, they're not really that close but then we go from there straight to the the much much lighter value at the bottom and if you squint you pretty much have three shapes one way or the other we could just like the second Caravaggio picture we could talk about it like it's four but if you squint at it it's really structured like it's three um but it's such a beautiful picture, and I love the um, the casualness of the writing. We're so used to um, Japanese uh, and, and Chinese calligraphy being this really refined, almost like you know, painstakingly printed thing. It's nice to see the 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 sort of fluid, almost cursive version 
uh, in this one. I, I've always liked this picture. Um, so that's the last image I was going to show. Uh, hopefully this video gave you an idea of how to think about the value strategies that you can start to use to make your work better, to make your color more complex, and, and how to not only structure the big ideas and the big values, values in your picture, but also how to take this thinking down into the details and to just make the whole thing that much richer and your, your, your work better for it.